Today, we are having a discussion about Henry's. And you might think it's the name, but it is not. It is High Earners Not Rich Yet. And I have with me today one of my favorite people and a money coach who you really do need to know, Lisa Chastain. And we're going to talk all about it. Let's do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you might be thinking that um, high earners are in a completely unreachable bracket as mm -hmm. far as their income is concerned. What are you seeing is actually that bracket? For high earners? Yeah. Well, I would say for women, anyone making over $100,000 a year is a high earner for women. For men, I would say one hundred fifty dollars to $250,000 a year. That puts you up a notch financially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are you seeing that, because I know we have a lot of discussions about debt, mm -hmm. even at that higher income bracket. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, honestly, I mean, is it inflation? Is it, you know, prices? I mean, is it a combination of everything, tax brackets? What is that that is making it feel like even at maybe that $250,000 range, we're not really seeing the benefits of that like we used to. Well, I don't, and I, knowing that the majority of Americans are still living paycheck to paycheck, there are so many pieces that go into the fold, regardless of how much you make or how much you don't make. With high income earners, it typically comes with a lifestyle yeah. attached to the paycheck. And some of some of the reason that high income earners may not have the assets that they want is that they have never learned how to hold on to money. They learned how to earn it and they learned how to spend it, which is a lot of the clients that I see, regardless of income bracket. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we learn how to spend money really well. Yeah. Holding on to it, learning how to invest it. We don't know what we would do with it. So it just comes in and goes right back out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing that in that um, income bracket that you are seeing a lot of debt? I'm seeing a lot of debt everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Business owners, high income earners, and everyone else. So credit card debt, so there's different kinds of debt. Right. Right. And when we look at someone's net worth, which is what I do, one of the first things I do with my clients is we calculate their net worth. Um, for, for Henry's, for high-income earners, not rich yet, what I will typically see is that there is some debt. Um, and the biggest gap is that there's a big hole in the asset category. So for a high-income earner, the debt may not feel so difficult. And I know when we met, you were in that category. Where yeah. The, like, whatever, I can pay my minimums. I'm paying the credit cards off. It just doesn't feel that stressful. Right. But it's when we look at the net worth and then they see that they don't have many assets, yeah. especially if they aren't yet homeowners, that depending on the age, usually around 40 is where people go, oh no, what am I doing? Yeah. What's going on here? Um, so debt happens for a lot of reasons for a lot of people and spending is, is one of those reasons. Yeah. Well, and that's what I try to let people know is that there's good debt and there's bad debt. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we're looking at people actually buying homes, mm -hmm. is that a good debt or is that a bad debt? Yeah. You know, because we've actually talked to people who are, you know, looking to be investors because you can be a first time home buyer, actually buy an income producing property that maybe it's a duplex. Mm -hmm. You live in one, you rent out the other. And then you can do that again in a couple of years, right. and then you can buy a home maybe that you like. Or like what's happening right now with real estate is you can't, in Las Vegas anyway right now, most people cannot go buy a single family home as their first home purchase because prices have gone up yeah. so much and interest rates are so high. Yep. And so what they're doing is now you're buying a condo or a townhome. And then you're holding on to that for a couple of years. And then you're taking the equity from that sale. And now you're getting closer to what that property is actually that you want to be living in. Yeah. I mean, that that emulates a lot of where and how people built wealth through real estate years and years ago. I think that's more a traditional route. 
what we saw in Vegas for so many years, we were really fortunate, Yeah, is that housing was not up to the national average. Housing was pretty inexpensive and the cost of living was pretty inexpensive. Right. And so back in the 80s and 90s, we had people right out of college or in college buying homes because they were affordable. Right. My husband bought his house 20 years ago for, well, this was right around the 2008 bubble. Yeah. Um, so he bought it for, let's say, $300,000, which was still pretty accessible for a lot of people at that price point. Yeah. But even a $200,000 home in Las Vegas got you a lot of home 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And today we're with a national average or above a national average, and the market's more volatile here, but that can't happen anymore. So you've right. got to start smaller and work your way up, which actually is really sound advice. And I think that it will reset people financially. I really do. It's just a longer cycle to wealth. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of even what we saw in our own journey is that if you have more, you spend more. And what I want, you know, our conversations to be around that is, you know, I want people to not only be making that money to where they feel as if they are high earners, Mm -hmm. but how do you actually get ahead? How do you actually get to where you're like, yes, I am a high earner and this shows in my decision making for what I buy or what I own or, you know, whatever that is. And I think that right now we're seeing that our conversations and our decision-making around that is changing. Yeah. Because of, you know, the, I I can't remember the statistic that I heard, you know, and of course on the news, you never know if everything is just totally, you know, blown out of proportion or it's not. Very, it's very by the minute with the news. It is. It's, this is what's hot right now. We're going to talk about it right now. Yes. And in a week, it may or may not be the same story. Yeah. So, I mean, are you finding that people that are coming to you that are Henry's, Mm -hmm. are they, what are they struggling with? The biggest challenges for Henry's is that, again, going back to that asset class, that asset pool, is maybe they do have some investments, but typically in the form we were just talking about pensions from an employer-based kind of situation. So they've put money in their 401k. Maybe they have a house. But Unless wealth is passed on generationally, a lot of people just don't know what they don't know because they've never been around money. So the American dream is you work really hard, you get a really good job, and you start earning money, great money, hopefully at some point. But it's not really until you get into your 30s and 40s that that kind of salary professionally is available to you. So I'm just going to like, I'll split it out. We've got our professional group or working class, people who are high earners, potentially executives, those kinds of things for companies. But then also we have business owners, and that's a very different conversation. So I'm just going to hang out here for a minute with professionals who are high income earners. They've worked really hard to get where they are at. So I think some of it's the psychology of I worked really hard to get here. I want to enjoy the fruits of my labor. Yeah, And there's a social class that goes with it. So then you have access to a different kind of social class. You get to go to Lifetime Fitness, for example. Yeah. Because you can afford a $200 a month gym membership. You yeah. can afford that now because you worked hard to get that. And that leveling up also comes with higher property taxes, higher purchases, better cars, bigger cars, those kinds of things. So it's not necessarily even daily spending. It's just leveling up that you can afford the nicer things, right? the luxury kinds of things. And that can get away from you really fast without a balance of saving at the same time. Yeah. And so the other thing that I I had spoke with um, someone in the financial industry also that I was very surprised that in their portfolio of Henry's that they deal with, mm-hmm. they are all W-2 employees. Mm-hmm. They are not the business owners, the entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. they are W-2 employees, which also leads me to believe that, you know, they are putting money away in a 401k. Mm -hmm. They may have profit sharing. They may have a pension. And so when you're dealing with, with that type of person, like I know one of the ways that somebody can purchase their primary residence 
is by using funds from their 401k yep. and they can buy their primary residence yep. that way. Is that something, and I'm sure it's a case-by-case basis, but is that something that if a Henry came to you mm-hmm. and said, listen, I have this amount of funds in my 401k, I am not yet a homeowner, um, would you suggest using that as a vehicle to purchase a home? It's an asset for an asset. So if we don't look at it, that's where is someone operating from abundance or scarcity or vision or having an actual financial plan? Yeah. Because someone might be really afraid to take that money out of their 401k thinking that that's my retirement money. That's all I'm going to have for retirement. If that's the case, that could be a very challenging conversation. Right. But I always look at it from, well, what's the mix of assets that you have? And for someone who's been really good at saving into their 401k but nowhere else, we need to diversify that anyway. Right. Because what we saw in 2008 was that 401ks bottom out. Yeah. Now, if you're young enough to recover that, great. But if you're not, where else are you going to be able to balance out your assets? So taking out, and again, with your 401k, it's, I think it's only somewhere around 10% that you can take out for the purchase of a home. I do know there is a max percentage that yeah. you can take. Last time I checked, it was 10%. So if you take out 10%, you use that toward the down payment. Correct. You might need to do that if you've not been a great saver otherwise and you don't have any other cash available or you don't have equity coming over from another home. Right. So it's not a bad strategy. It's just really looking at those mix of assets. And the way I always look at it is it's you're just exchanging one asset for another because that money's not going anywhere. You're just putting it into an asset that you also can't take money out of unless you refinance or... Right. You got to look at the bigger vision of what you're trying to create. Yeah. So short-term pain, maybe you're going to take a dip in your 401k, but then you can have a property, which is another income generating asset, potentially an equity. So I don't think it's bad one way or the other. I think it's about vision. And it's a more risk tolerance yeah. conversation Absolutely. that you're having. Absolutely. I mean, if someone has $300,000 in their 401k because they've been a good saver in their 401k and taken advantage of the matches, if you're going to pull out $30,000 for the down payment of your home, you, you'll you recover that pretty quickly in your 401k yeah. as long as you continue to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the one thing about home ownership is that people, first-time homeowners especially, don't understand all of the other costs that go into keeping up a home. Right. So you look at the mortgage payment and you're like, oh, I can totally make the mortgage payment. Right. But as a first time home, home buyer, you really want to make sure that you have the ability to either continue to invest or I was just having a conversation with a homeowner today where he's like, my water heater went out, my dishwasher <laughs> yeah. went out, yeah. all these things went out. Or if you want to remodel the home, that there's money for that too. Yeah. You have to adjust your behaviors according to what it is that you say you really want. And I think the real reason that Henry's go into debt is that they're just doing a great job of keeping their lifestyle going without necessarily planning for anything bigger picture. Because especially as a W-2, which it doesn't mean it's security, but if you're a W-2, sometimes you rely on that as your security that I've got a job, I've got a paycheck coming in. We take that for granted. Yeah. And the one thing that you want to shift as a Henry is your mindset around, well, what if I wanted to leave my job tomorrow? Right. What if I wanted to? Yeah. And is your paycheck really security? After the last 20 years, I'm pretty convinced it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as the age of a Henry, yeah, are you seeing or do you have any kind of statistics of what age range that is? Well, if it, if we're talking about W-2s again, yeah. then we're talking about someone who's earning over $200,000 a year. How did they get where they got? Well, right. some people inherited those kinds of roles through family. Most likely, even if they did, they had to take a certain professional path to get there. So right. let's think doctors, lawyers, dentists, those kinds of things that are earning that amount. They had to go through college and get some professional experience to get to that wage. So we're probably looking at people that are mid-30s, maybe 30s, but mid-30s and above. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and the other other thing that I find so interesting is that we've been talking a lot 
um, kind of in in my circles about the great wealth transfer mm-hmm. that is going to start happening where, you know, like our parents' age, they got pensions, they worked and saved and scrimped and didn't spend a dime, yep. and they've owned their homes forever. Mm-hmm. And when they do pass those homes that have now doubled, tripled, quadrupled in value— are going to be sold and those inheritances are going to be paid out to their children Mm -hmm. and grandchildren. There is a big wave of inheritances coming, which is going to transfer a big amount of wealth Mm -hmm. to people who, you know, may be not the best savers, not the best as far as, you know, kind of taking care of their credit or living within their means. We grew up, I think, um, in the boom of the credit card society. We sure did. Where if you couldn't afford it, you had credit to to spend it on. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you think that great wealth transfer is going to change kind of what we're looking at today. Wow. Well, let's let's talk about women first, since that's my groove. We'll talk yeah. about men and women. What we're going to see that's going to be a huge shift, and we've seen it steadily go up over the last couple of decades, is women owning wealth in the first place. Right. So right now, women own about, in America, about $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Okay. That's a lot of money. We would it think is. that. But in the next decade, $30 trillion is coming our way as women. And that's a small percentage of people in general that own that wealth. And with yeah. the wealth transfer, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading on this to try to figure out what we can do for women to be ready. Yeah. And also wealth that passes on from generation to generation. There's a certain mindset that goes along with that. For the first transfer, it's likely that that money will be held on to. I know we we have a, a friend in common, Dana. We talk about this all the time. What what will happen is that typically in, in an event for wealth, when it does transfer, is that that person will not stay with the advisor that that wealth originally was at. And if it's real estate, there was no advisor right. that was with that real estate. So one, finding a good credible, trustworthy financial person to support you with that transfer. Because if you don't want to lose it, there's a lot. When we're talking about wealth, let's just say that we're talking about a million dollars and up. There's tax liabilities, there's laws, there's things that you have to do to make sure that that wealth is being well invested and that you can hold on to it. That would be the ultimate goal. Right. So knowing that there's $30 trillion coming to women, it's about 15% of America's wealth. So when you look at it that way, we call it a great wealth transfer, but for women, there's still a lot of work to do for us to be able to hold on to that wealth. Right. So when it transfers for a Henry, when it does transfer to you, know now what your game plan is going to be. Start creating relationships and support systems now to help you reset or reframe any behaviors that you need to so that that wealth doesn't just get spent. Because by the third generation of transfer, usually that wealth is gone. Right. Right because of high um, high earning spending that right. goes with it. So if you're if you're in a position to inherit wealth, it's likely, not always, but it's likely that you grew up in an environment around money. So I'm, I mean, this is a generalization because I can't talk to everybody, right. but if that's the case, get curious now and learn what you need to learn to be ready for that. Because it's not going to be a surprise when you get it. You should be at some right. point anticipating that kind of wealth. For those of you where it's not anticipated or you're not used to having wealth or you're not used to, <laughs> It's right? coming at you like a runaway train. Yeah. yeah. Life insurance is also another reason we're having this. We're going to have a wealth transfer is that life insurance has grown exponentially. Yeah. Families have learned that they can build generational wealth and build legacy through life insurance. Yeah. But again, if someone's just paying a life insurance policy and you're not accustomed to this kind of lifestyle and you inherit a million dollars, which is entirely possible, people who win the, um, people who win the lottery, it's gone. 
Right. Because of your mindset. Right. So as much as we want professionals helping us, we have to shift our mindset to be able to have that kind of wealth if we yes. didn't earn it ourselves. So I heard a very interesting um, conversation in a um, in a networking group that there are people who are billionaires mm-hmm. who go bankrupt. Yep. And then a couple years later, they're a billionaire again. Yep. And it's because their threshold for earning is set. Yep. They are a billionaire. Yep. So when we get that mindset of, oh, we're we're poor or we're at this level, you will always return to that level because that is where your mindset has stopped. That's right. And there's no growth beyond that. That's right. So that internal self, you know, growth or encouraging us to go beyond what we have known um, or where we think we can go, those are huge conversations that we need to be having. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. It's our set point in mindset. And if we don't level up our set point in mindset or, or, handle or deal with anything unresolved within us, we'll return to our comfort zone, which is what we call sabotage. Yeah. So that sabotage will happen. It happens all the time. But you're right. If someone knows how to earn enough money and invest money in the right way to be a billionaire, well, how did they get there? It wasn't through a W-2 job. Right. It was through taking risk, investing big. Some of it panned out. Some of it didn't, right? And you can earn it again if you've earned it once. So millionaires yeah. gain and lose their millionaires now seems more commonplace. Yeah, it's not though. Only five percent of Americans are millionaires today. Right, it's really not that commonplace. We just see it so much now on social media and all the things, or people who are pretending to be millionaires who aren't. <laughs> you know, yeah. So the wealth conversation, the Henry conversation, it's just such a really interesting one. And with the wealth transfer. Um, knowing that that amount of money is coming to women, even so much more is coming to men. Yeah. And I hope that, I really hope that in this next decade, we can make headway together so that everybody's having a healthier conversation with our money. Because in America, we got a lot of issues when it comes to money and yeah. our spending and our debt. It's not just consumers. It's like the whole country. Right. Yeah, it's a country at large. Yeah. Yeah, So when we, our family, when we started kind of putting together a plan, you were the first person Mm -hmm. that I met with. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that plan did not always look great. Yeah. Because I I was raised not looking at money. Yep. Because if you don't have it, why do you need to look at it? Yep. And so we had to have that you know, mindset shift Mm -hmm. within our family to be able to grow beyond what we had experienced growing up. And so when we started having that conversation, we brought other experts in. Um, We brought in an estate attorney to get everything written down that we wanted. I mean, I had done a will before, Mm -hmm. but I had never done a trust. I had never gone through that process of planning what would happen to my family. As a matter of fact, please don't show this to my children, but one of my kids wasn't even in our will. I remember that. And so it's like, um, what what was going to happen to her? Do you know what I mean? If anything ever happened to us, these conversations are so vital to mm-hmm. have. And are they uncomfortable? They can be. Agreed. I mean, they, they're they not easy conversations. As we're putting together this trust for our family, I mean, we're looking at each other with some of these questions saying, huh? Mm-hmm. Like, you want us to decide what? And they're not always easy. They're not. But it does bring about those types of conversations that people who are wealthy have Mm -hmm. because they're not meant to be emotional necessarily. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be rational. They're meant to, you know, provide for your family and they're meant to elevate the status of your family wealth 
if you use somebody who is going to do it correctly. Right. The other person that we met with was a wealth advisor. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, my husband is getting a pension. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for retirement? Is there an age? Is there a golden, you know, time frame that we should be looking at? And there is. Mm -hmm. And so again, whatever your circumstances are, these are things that you have to look at. What other kind of preparation or strategic planning do you suggest? So when someone, so like we have to isolate kind of the kind of person that we're talking to because everybody's situation is so unique. Right. So I'll speak directly to a Henry who's making great money, who would self would say that they know nothing about money. Yeah. They're really good at their jobs. They they are really good at what they do, but they didn't write, they weren't raised around money. Yeah. They don't exactly know what they don't know. Right. Having a st- an estate planning attorney, especially if you have kids, is so important because everything that you're working so hard for, you want to make sure there's a plan for it. Right. Then the the wealth, the right wealth advisor will support you in your growth and ma- in your maturity. They start with where you're at, start putting some away where it makes sense, and they'll be with you. Find the right financial advisor who will be with you until that wealth passes on to your children. That's the ultimate goal. So when I'm looking for an advisor, I'm looking for someone who's going to be there when something happens. Um, And then the other thing that I think a lot of Henry's miss out on is tax savviness. So having a CPA on your team, maybe you've had somebody plan your taxes or maybe you've done them yourself because it's a straightforward W-2. You've got your 401k. You've got your W-2. Maybe you have mortgage interest that you, yeah. you hand in. But um, as you earn more money, you pay more taxes. Right. And the right CPA is going to help you pay less to the IRS. And, well, in combination with a CPA and a financial advisor, they'll make sure that you pay less to the IRS and that you can put more of that back into your wealth plan. Right. And that's a huge miss for a lot of families earning W-2s. So yeah. that's that's my go-to on the professional services side. Having a qualified, great estate attorney, having um, estate planning turning, having a good financial advisor, and then having your CPA, having them all work together yeah. is, um, and, and every October or every November, getting them all together to make sure that everything's working in your favor. Because right. you can pay a lot to the IRS and think that that's just what you have to do, and that's not always the case. Right. Yeah. So I would say definitely, definitely make sure that you have those different professionals. Another thing that with uh, with Henry's, especially if you weren't raised around money or around people who talked about money, which my family didn't a whole right. lot, is you might have a perception that those people cost a lot of money. Or you're right. scared— Right. Or you're judging yourself like, well, I don't make enough money to go see them or they're going to judge me because of this, that, and this, or I'm not making enough. These are all the stories that we tell ourselves for why we don't have those conversations. And it's probably hurting you financially. So invest in the right team. They'll make sure you're taken care of and your family's taken care of for years to come. Right. And then like my estate planning attorney, which we have the same one, yeah. I think, um, I get yearly reminders of like, hey, has your plan changed? Right. I love that because I don't stay on top of it either. Well, and that was like, we had a new grandchild. Like that grandchild needs to be added to that mm-hmm. estate plan, you know? And and I think the other thing that is so interesting, like you said, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but the value that these professionals bring far outweighs Absolutely. the cost. Absolutely. And I think that is the part that we're kind of missing. Mm-hmm. We're looking at, oh my gosh, it costs how much to do this? But that that peace of mind that you get when you have this, you know, this is this is your life if anything happens to me. Everything is right here. Yeah. They are going to advocate for you. They are going to stand in my in my place. They are going to, you know, protect you at all cost. Um that that value is priceless. It really is. You know, and so I I think that maybe if you have not felt that value that you've been getting that value, 
you may need to find a different professional. Okay. And I mean, and we have a lot of resources here in the Las Vegas Valley that we can send you to because you should feel as if you would pay them 10 times what they charge mm -hmm. because they brought so much value to you. I yeah. Agree. I mean, and I still, every time I have to pay my CPA, I'm still cringing. <laughs> but, you know, I want that assurity that it's being done correctly. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, it's, it's, and this is as a business owner, but, you know, I don't want to be audited. Yeah. I don't want that. No. You know, so I want somebody who knows what they're doing. That's right. And can add that security at the end of the day to where I can sleep at night. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You've, you've got to have a team. And as you level up financially, the people on the team are going to change. They are. And what I love about, um, what I love about having a good estate planning attorney on my team is it's not just the, it's not just my estate in the, in the moment, but if we buy another property, how do we structure that? How do exactly. we protect that? You have people that you can that you can consult before you make big decisions to know on every side of the house how it's going to be structured properly exactly. and how it can be taken care of. Yep. So having the right person that cares enough to sit down, I, I get this from women a lot, like that they they don't want to made they don't want to be made to feel dumb. Right. So then they don't ask the questions or they try to handle it themselves. And as you go up in income bracket. Things change. Things get weird. Life gets weird. Things happen. And that's actually for anybody, but especially as you're making more money, you've got more toys. You've got more things to deal with. Having people on your team means that you're not handling it all. Yeah. Going back to spending really quick, I forgot to say this, is I think one of the things that happens with Henry's is that life just gets really busy because you're busy working. Right. You're maximizing your working years, which means you're making great money. But without having people on your team, things just get away from you. Right. So you put something on a credit card, you forget about it, and all of a sudden, it's you know, it's like going up in interest. You don't know how to refinance it. All of those things can be handled with the right team. Right. Yeah, and I I think the other thing that is that is super important about having um those specific advisors is that like I've met with my CPA before and he's like, listen, when you get to this amount of money, you need to, number one, you know, get a rental property, mm -hmm. do this, do that, do something that is going to bring your tax, yep. you know, liability down. And so, and the other thing that is so important is I think we feel as women, a lot of times that we're in silos, mm -hmm. we have to take care of everything yep. ourselves. To ask for help, you shouldn't do that. You should just by osmosis right. know everything <laughs> about everything. Right. And so we really do, or I'll say I, really wait until the last possible second before everything blows up mm -hmm. in your face to ask for help. Mm -hmm. But everyone feels the same way. Yeah. I mean, you will talk to probably 10 people and nine of them will have the same questions. Yeah. I learned this lesson really just through business yeah. is that I was helping a client who was an attorney mm -hmm. and he asked me a question about something on the process. And I, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't think to mention that to you because you were an attorney. Yep. And he said the greatest thing to me. He said, Eileen, I am a specialist mm -hmm. at what I do. I don't do what you do. Mm -hmm. You are the specialist in what you do. Yep. And it gave me permission to be the specialist. I love that. And so it was, you know, I think that's what we have to realize. Mm -hmm. There are things that we are going to be specialists in yeah. and the things that we're not it is okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for guidance. Outsource that shit. Absolutely. <laughs> right. And, and you will be so much lighter because you're not carrying mm -hmm. that whole burden for you and everyone else in your world. That's right. That's yeah. right. One of the reasons that I became a coach is that I can be that neutral party to say, I'm not attached to taxes. I'm not attached to you paying me as a financial advisor. You're paying me as a coach. And it's it's my job 
to be that safe place yeah. for you to ask any question that you have, to figure out where you are emotionally with things so that when you do get in front of your professional, you feel ready. Right. And and also I'm there to help interpret some of that stuff too. Right. So the coaching aspect is um, really valuable too. So with mindset, realize that to that point, a CPA is not trained to deal with your mindset. Right. An attorney is not trained to deal with your mindset, right? right? That a good uh, a good quarterback, a good coach, a good therapist, you know, they'll yeah. help you deal with the emotional stuff so you can continue to stay in action and grow in the way that you want to grow. So build a team. Yeah. Use some of that money to build and a team. And she's also there so that if you do have a freak out, she can bring you back down right. to reality and actually make a plan. Okay, all you Henrys, if you are ready to level up, change your mindset, make a plan, be strategic about it so that you can get to the next level. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to Lisa and we will set you up for success because all that money that you're earning, we want it to grow, benefit you, benefit your family for generations to come. So when you're ready, let's chat and we will get you going in the right direction.